it's really nice to have you all here. My name is Dana Murphy Parker. I am the president elect of the International Nurses Society on Addictions. And we're really happy to, uh, to bring you this, uh, this webinar and this information. Uh, INSA's mission is to advance excellence in nursing care for the prevention and treatment of addictions for all diverse populations across all practice settings through, cl uh, through advocacy, collaboration, education, research, and policy. It is our vision to be a global leader in addictions nursing. Just wanted to share with you our 45th upcoming conference. We actually had planned to go to Calgary, Alberta in 2020, and uh, of course couldn't go due to, due to COVID. Didn't have one last year, and we're really hopeful that this is gonna be an in-person, but there will be some virtual options as well uh, for, the, for the conference in Calgary this coming October. Okay. Uh, just a couple of disclosure statements. There, there is no conflict of interest for anyone um, who is associated with this uh, um, educational activity. Um, and um, a, an instance disclaimer is simply that we do not formally endorse the practice. We, this presentation is being provided for education regarding what is being considered by some practitioners. And um, we think the topic is a really important one and delighted to have Dr. Bloom here to do it. So if I could just have the next slide. Um, the, uh, just to let all the nurses that are here know that this course has been approved by the California Board of Registered Nurses for one hour of nursing CEU. Um, the licensee must retain the document for four years after the course concludes. All participants will receive their certificate of attendance with the CE after the completion of the webinar survey. The webinar will be recorded and is available for viewing if you're unable to attend right now. We will keep it up on INSA's e-learning portal. So or I put in both. I'm sorry? Oh, okay. Uh, okay, next slide, please. I am very, very happy to introduce to you Dr. Joshua Bloom. Uh, Dr. Bloom is the um, okay. Not the um, is for your the, I'm sorry, uh, Dorcia, can you turn your mic off, please? Yeah. Okay. Um, so, so we have the objectives. Uh, everybody saw that when they registered. So, just go ahead to the next slide. Uh, how's she, how are you doing? Um, and oh, okay. So, Dr. Bloom, uh, I want to make sure everybody knows he is um, he is a physician. He is in Denver. He certainly works with uh, with people who have substance use disorders in this um, uh, in, with that population. And again, he is the president of the Colorado chapter of ASAM. So, I'm very happy to turn it over and to introduce you to Dr. Bloom. Go ahead. Thank, thank you so much, Dan. It's really, I'm so happy to be here and happy to have so many people on the call. Um, I, uh, I feel like I am learning about this topic uh, along the way, um, probably with you all. I'm sure there are some of you who are very uh, uh, familiar with this um, and maybe just want a little refresher, but others, this might be, this might be absolutely new to you. Um, I, am, I would not consider myself an expert. This is a, an emerging field, um, but uh, talk to a lot of people about this and have been practicing with uh, low dose induction strategies over the last um, couple years um, with varying degrees of success and just want to share uh, some information with you about it and why this is becoming um, such an important emerging topic. So again, I have no disclosures. Here's what we'll go over. I will uh, spend a couple slides talking about the fentanyl epidemic that we're all familiar with and then how that relates to our buprenorphine use. Um, low dose induction or what's called microdosing induction in patients on chronic opioid therapy or illicit opioids. And then, and then maybe just briefly touch on macrodosing or um, the ED, the emergency department as a site for alternative induction strategies. So I like to, I'm a clinician, so I like to frame things through cases. So just to give you a couple of real world cases of, of my patients, one from my primary care clinic, one from my addiction clinic. The first is a 38 year old male 
with HIV and a history of trauma, panic attacks, chronic widespread pain. He uses marijuana daily. He's otherwise healthy. He's a cab driver, actually. And he is on a very chronic stable regimen of fentanyl patch, 50 micrograms, along with tramadol as needed for breakthrough pain. He, he actually wants to stay on that current regimen, but he's willing to try a switch. Uh, um, I was interested in trying to uh, switch him over to, um, uh, to buprenorphine as a somewhat uh, lower risk um, alternative to that regimen, especially since he drives a cab. He was instructed to remove his uh, fentanyl patch and continue tramadol. And then after 24 hours, he was going to put on a buprenorphine patch, uh, a transdermal patch, which is the preparation for pain. After two days, he noted worsening body aches, chills, and pain. And two weeks later, he was still uncomfortable, said his pain was worse, and asked to switch back to the fentanyl patch. Uh, case two is a 43-year-old female with a history of alcohol use disorder for many years. She had a recent divorce after years of sobriety, which led to relapse. And then she began using opioids just three months ago. She's been buying street oxycodone, uh, so she says, using 10 to 20 tablets a day, which she uses by smoking. And last used 12 hours ago, she's in moderate opioid withdrawal. When I saw her, I was actually on the inpatient addiction consult service uh, at Denver Health, and my hospital, and uh, she was in moderate opioid withdrawal. These are the pills, uh, a sample picture of the pills she, uh, she was using. The emergency department had given her um, four milligrams of buprenorphine sublingual at which time her withdrawal symptoms worsened. They then gave her an additional eight milligrams of buprenorphine and her withdrawal symptoms continued to worsen to the point where she was so agitated she required restraint. She was given a couple doses of lorazepam, um, which really didn't calm her down uh, enough or didn't, didn't uh, treat the agitation sufficiently. And after four hours with increasing CKs, CPKs, you know, signs of muscle inflammation and vomiting, she had a possible aspiration event and wound up getting admitted to our ICU for further management. So the question, of course, what, what happened here? Why did this happen to someone using street oxycodone? Well, as many of you I'm sure know this, uh, uh, was a, a case of precipitated withdrawal. Um, this occurs when we replace a full agonist with a partial agonist or even an antagonist. It can be really severe. And then when you have this, you have a few different options, especially in the emergency department as this person was located, um, including just simply just over-treating, giving more opioids to try to over-treat the the precipitated withdrawal symptoms and, and give it more time, give them more buprenorphine in other words. Um, supportive measures, medications for all those symptoms like nausea, like the agitation, which, which they tried with lorazepam and some other things in the emergency department before admitting her. Um, or potentially giving her, again, a full agonist, treating her with uh, a high potency full agonist like hydromorphone or something else to try to, to try to knock the buprenorphine off the opioid receptor to alleviate those, those symptoms. Before we talk a little bit further about that, I just want to, you know, uh, make sure we're all on the same page. And none of you live under a rock, so you're all familiar with the uh, the three waves of the opioid epidemic that we've seen. The most recent one being the incredible increase in illicit synthetic opioids. Um, they mentioned yeah, under synthetic opioids, tramadol and fentanyl, but really what we're talking about is illicitly produced fentanyl in clandestine labs, either in China or in south of the border that are um, brought up through distribution networks um, into the United States or down from Canada. Um, so uh, just to give you an idea from my, from my hometown, from Denver, um, these are what the pills look like. And the Denver Police Crime Laboratory has done some testing of these. And here's what they found in these pills from, from Denver. Um, uh, and if you are, if you are listening, please, please mute your microphones to make sure we can uh, all hear each other. Um, so mostly fentanyl, but occasionally even uh, some other cogeners of fentanyl and even some other things unrelated to fentanyl like diphenhydramine or even methamphetamine have been found in these tablets. Uh, so there's no, as my friend Lisa Ravel will say, there's no better business bureau for uh, fentanyl or heroin. You don't really know what you're getting and you don't know concentrations of these of these substances. Speaking of which, this is data from the DEA um, through late last year, looking at 
the number of fentanyl pills and powder seized. And they released a, a, a warning, um, uh, an announcement, I believe it was in September of last year, um, just calling attention to the fact that through October of 2021, they had already seized substantially more fentanyl pills than in the entirety of 2020. You can see 3.7 million compared to 3.1 million and uh, just a massive, massive increase in the last few years of, uh, of fentanyl pills uh, uh, seized over the West. And then you can see fentanyl powder as well increasing. That has a little bit different distribution network typically um, from California um, uh, over, um, as opposed to coming up directly into Colorado through you know, Arizona and um, through cartels from south of the border. In addition to the increase in, in a number of tablets, uh, the, uh, what we've also seen has been an incredible increase in the average fentanyl dose in these tablets. You can see on the left through 2020, uh, they had gone from an average milligram portion of fentanyl of 1.3 to 2.2. And remember 2000 uh, uh, micrograms or two, two, two milligrams is considered a lethal dose of fentanyl. So uh, as of 2020, 42% of the tablets of fentanyl being seized actually contained a lethal dose of fentanyl. Pretty, pretty terrifying. As a result, we're actually predicting, um, uh, the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment in my state is predicting uh, an increase. Um, we, we've certainly seen a huge increased number of deaths over the last few years, but we're actually pr um, predicting an even greater increase again in 2022 over 2021, despite all the efforts and efforts at harm reduction and naloxone distribution and other things. So fentanyl is here to stay, as you can see, and we have to be able to manage that and, uh, and to respond to that. So when it comes to treatment, what, is that, what does that look like? That's what we're gonna talk about. Um, again, here's this graph of precipitated withdrawal. That's what happens when you take someone who's on a full opioid agonist and you knock them down to either partial agonist or antagonist. The fentanyl that we are seeing uh, 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 in circulation is highly lipophilic. Fentanyl in general is highly lipophilic. Um, it has a very short onset of action, short duration of action. So people get um, very high very quickly, but then are in withdrawal fairly quickly. The problem is with repeated use, it really behaves like a long acting opioid. It deposits in those fat cells and has a very large volume of distribution. And uh, so what we see are very severe withdrawal symptoms, but even when people are in severe withdrawal, they uh, still behave as though, um, as though they have active drug on board. So people have high tolerance with repeated use and people can present in moderate, even moderately severe withdrawal and still wind up getting worsened withdrawal when we try to induct them onto buprenorphine. So the concept behind buprenorphine microdosing is to initiate the buprenorphine at very low doses while the patient continues to use his or her usual opioid, whether that's a licit opioid or an illicit opioid. The usual opioid is then discontinued once the patient reaches a high therapeutic level of buprenorphine. Um, and this was first evaluated in opioid use disorder, but again, is being used in, in now in patients who are on uh, uh, long-acting pain medications or in transitioning patients from methadone to buprenorphine. So again, the idea is you slowly replace the full agonist opioid, whether that's methadone or heroin or fentanyl or anything else with buprenorphine and the, uh, with, in the hope of preventing precipitated withdrawal. And so uh, we're gonna talk uh, uh, about the nuts and bolts of that in just a second. So uh, this is possible in part because buprenorphine has a really high binding affinity compared with other opioids. This is a list of, uh, of opioids. I'm sorry, this is very, very small, showing the, the kappa I, the, the KI of various opioids. And, and if you can see in the bottom graph, buprenorphine is at the top of the list, essentially, in terms of the affinity for the opioid receptor, highly avid for the opioid receptor. Uh, fentanyl has a very broad KI. I'm not really sure why it, it's showing it being so broad, but uh, I think this just has to do with experimental studies. Um, in general, it's highly avid for the opioid receptor as well. Um, but buprenorphine is so avid that it can actually displace even, um, even other highly avid uh, uh, opioids off of the opioid receptor. So the idea behind, behind microdosing is that 
you, if you look at the percentage of occupied receptors that might be occupied by the uh, individual's drug of choice, um, you are slowly replacing that uh, with buprenorphine as you increase the dose of buprenorphine. So you can see um, from the right to the left, the percentage of occupied receptors when someone is on 0.25 milligrams of buprenorphine or 0.5 is relatively low. But as you increase that dose, that, uh, that uh, receptor occupancy really goes up fairly linearly. Um, once you're up at around eight milligrams, uh, you're at a pretty high level of the receptor occupancy. So hopefully that, that makes sense from a, from a um, at least from a pharmacologic standpoint. Now we're gonna talk a little bit about, about the actual um, management of it. So uh, low dose buprenorphine induction or microdosing, um, this, is, this has around 10 publications that includes case series and case reports. The initial uh, study was uh, published out of uh, Switzerland by Hammig and colleagues in 2016. Um, it's been studied in various patient populations written here. And for the most part, precipitated withdrawal has uh, really been a rare occurrence in these case series and, and case reports. Um, so this is being done um, very commonly. Um, there's just not a ton of evidence um, to, support, to support this. Um, so... Uh, we're going to talk a little bit more, but I would say this is not, this is really not a controversial topic anymore. All of us who are seeing lots of fentanyl use uh, feel like we need to have an alternative way to induct people onto buprenorphine, um, especially because um, while methadone may be an easier choice for a lot of individuals who are using fentanyl and simply can't stop um, long enough to undergo full dose induction, um, methadone is not available in most places. It's a, it's a limited resource. So even though I work in a methadone clinic and I'm lucky enough to have that option, um, a lot of others don't have that option. Um, further, uh, the, the federal regulations around methadone limit uh, use of methadone for maintenance therapy to individuals who've had an opioid use disorder for at least 12 months. And I'm not sure about you all, but I'm seeing a lot of people including the patient in case two, who had opioid use disorder for only a few months um, prior to presenting for care. Um, the fentanyl so potent, she was experiencing pretty profound consequences from her use after just, after just a few months of use. But unfortunately, methadone is actually not an option uh, for her for ongoing maintenance. So this is the Bernese method. It's just written out here very, very uh, simply. I'll, I'll walk you through it and we'll look at this and other some of the other strategies that have been presented. Um, the, uh, on day one, someone would take a half a milligram of buprenorphine. So you can see um, this, well, this slide, uh, the picture shows an eight slash two milligram strip or film, um, but the if you prescribed a two milligram film, you might cut it in half and then cut it again into a quarter. Um, so day one, you take a half a milligram once a day, day two, a half a milligram twice a day, then day three, that's increased to one BID, day four, two milligrams BID, and, and so on. You can see two to three to four. And then on day seven, the patient would take 12 milligrams twice a day, up to a total of 24 milligrams of buprenorphine, and then stop all other opioids. So the patient is continuing to use his or her opioid of choice during this induction week, um, hopefully in lowering amounts. Hopefully they're, they're using uh, less and less over the course of that week, but, but um, that's not a requirement. So here's again, the idea, this is a slightly different dosing um, protocol. This is uh, uh, from a, a little bit of a different, uh, this is from a different publication, um, starting at 0.25 milligrams um, using even um, uh, pills um, and starting at again, that 0.25 milligram daily to BID to 5.5 BID to one. And you can see slowly increasing that, uh, that dose. Um, so I would, I would just, tell all of you it's, it's less about the exact dosing protocol and more about just the concept of slowly replacing the individual's opioid of choice uh, with buprenorphine on the receptor. Um, so here's the, the, uh, the Bernese protocol again. There was also, um, maybe if there's time, we'll talk about this uh, case series 
um, just a few patients published out of Yale, looking at chronic pain patients who were transitioning to buprenorphine and looking at uh, the same thing. These are folks on oxycodone, uh, long acting oxycodone, um, who uh, they used a little bit of a faster uh, uh, titration protocol. Um, there have been several, this is uh, from a review article by Marwa and Canadian Family Physicians that was published in, um, in 2020, again, showing uh, e even doses as low as, if you look at option three on day one, it's a quarter milligram uh, in the morning and, uh, and then um, uh, plus an extra 0 0.0625. So um, very, very low dose initiations. And you can see on the right, in the, in the column on the right, no matter what you do, um, you typically will also use uh, adjunctive medications because patients will experience some degree of withdrawal symptoms, even with these nice gentle uh, and, and sometimes long um, microdosing titration strategies. You can see in option one, it's a 14 day, uh, it's a 14 day titration. Um, where it also starts uh, lower dose. But so um, whether you do it over seven days, over 14 days, um, over 21 days, um, patients are likely to have some um, hiccups along the way in terms of some experience of, of withdrawal symptoms. That should not be the same as uh, a precipitated withdrawal. And it should, they, those withdrawal symptoms should not be um, as severe. So uh, just, we actually hosted... Um, Colorado Society of Addiction Medicine hosted, uh, we hosted a night about uh, this issue, fentanyl and low dose um, buprenorphine inductions uh, in the late, um, uh, just a few months ago, actually, and uh, had some speakers from around the country talk about this. And, and one of the things that uh, was overwhelmingly expressed was just that in order to be successful for this, you either have to have the patient in a monitored environment, namely like being on an inpatient service or something like that, where you can see the person every day or simply provide a lot of support to the patient because it's, it's really a journey uh, doing this micro dosing. And that's actually my personal experience has, has also reflected that, that um, you can write all this out, you can uh, send the patient out with the prescriptions, but they're gonna need a lot of check-ins um, and, and a lot of explanation and a lot of education around this. So the three main points about doing this successfully are absolutely please prescribe adjunctive medications. Um, we'll talk about those in a minute. Try to simplify the process for the patients as much as possible. And then if you can, uh, and not if you can, you really have to, offer a lot of support to the individual with um, uh, uh, either from you or from your staff. So, so what do the supportive medications look like? I'll tell you, this is um, my typical uh, regimen that I will prescribe to every single patient I am, I am doing this for. So clonidine, of course, I, I know most of you are probably very familiar with these medications and how to use them, but for patients, you really have to write it out. Okay, you're gonna take the clonidine, and I really want you to lean heavily on that medicine. You can take it up to every four hours. If you take one and you tolerate it well, and it, uh, but it wasn't quite enough, you can even take a second one, especially for young, healthy people without uh, risk of hypotension. You're gonna use that for the sweating and the goosebumps. So you really, I also write out the indications very clearly for the patients so they know what to take when. You know, our, our patients, our clients are very savvy with drugs, right? If they have been using drugs either, um, either illicitly or, or simply opioids for pain, they, they probably, first of all, have experienced withdrawals. They know what it, it feels like. Um, they know what their symptoms are. Um, they also know what they've done in the past to manage those symptoms. So they're, and they also uh, are likely to be people who are willing to take medications or drugs to manage symptoms. So I, I take great pains to tell them, look, you know, you know what this feels like, you know how to manage your body, you've been living in it your whole life. So I'm going to give you all the medications you need to help support yourself through this. And, and I think patients will feel very empowered. I, I really don't worry very much about people, let's say overdosing or taking too much of these medications. Um, and uh, 
Um, because again, they, they are going to be very savvy about managing these. And so um, I really spend a lot of time walking patients through this. And I think in general, in medicine, we tend to underutilize these supportive medicines. Even when we prescribe them, we probably prescribe them in um, too low of a dose, or we don't adequately explain, explain to patients how to use them. So clonidine, of course, uh, on Dancitron, um, you can use four or eight milligrams. If it's four milligrams, I usually recommend that every six hours or eight milligrams every eight hours. Of course, that's for nausea and vomiting. Hydroxyzine, 50 milligrams every six hours. I will tell young and, and healthier patients they can even take 100 milligrams if they need to. Um, that is a, actually a common dose used for itch. So that's for the anxiety and insomnia. I also um, worked for a long time in the Denver city and county jails, and we leaned very heavily on hydroxyzine as a non-habit forming alternative for anxiety for patients. Um, ibuprofen, of course, uh, 600 milligrams uh, every six hours. That's for those really severe um, body aches. Uh, loperamide then for diarrhea, I usually say one to two at the onset of diarrhea and a max of eight tablets a day. Um, you can take one after every loose stool. I will also, I didn't put it on this slide, but I often, depending on the individual, will add gabapentin. Gabapentin is a little bit controversial, I suppose, for some because it can be habit forming itself. It also, uh, there have been uh, studies showing that gabapentin is associated with a higher likelihood of opioid overdose in patients who are prescribed both opioids and gabapentin. Um, but I usually feel pretty uh, confident in prescribing gabapentin, especially again to, to younger and healthier individuals uh, um, with, uh, with opioid use disorder in a short course. Gabapentin um, I find to be um, quite helpful as an adjunct for the acute anxiety people associate with, um, uh, with withdrawal symptoms and also has less of the mouth drawing effects of hydroxyzine, less of those, less of those anticholinergic antihistaminic effects that we associate with hydroxyzine. So I think gabapentin is a good alternative. And I think patients, again, feel very empowered when you give them the, the kitchen sink like this, when you give them a laundry list of medications they can use to manage their symptoms. I think you're really sending the message that, hey, I, I really want you to be as comfortable as possible. It, it may not be perfect, but I'm going to give you a lot of different things you can help to manage your symptoms. Then uh, we, another strategy, again, simplify as much as possible. So I usually start by prescribing the two milligram film. Um, these of course come individually wrapped and we'll say, all right, uh, you know, cut it in half and then take the half and cut that in half. That's about as simple, I feel, as you can get it. The, the two milligram film is the same size as the eight milligram film. So it's, it's still a reasonable size. It's not like people are taking microscopic amounts of the film and having to, you know, pick it off the, the scissors with their fingernail so, or, or off the knife. So, uh, and, and again, it's a quarter film once a day, then a quarter film twice a day, then a half a film twice a day, then one film twice a day, et cetera. And they can use a, a pill box um, to put those in so that they have it done ahead of time um, if that's helpful for them. Um, then the last piece is the support piece. And again, I can't stress this enough. Um, I uh, actually just started two patients, a, a couple, a, a male and a female this week on, um, on this protocol and uh, touched base with them the next day. And I will be calling them right after this this webinar actually to see how they're doing. Um, so uh, that support, that, that daily check-in, if they know, and it doesn't have to be you, the provider, it can be um, someone else in the clinic. It could be, uh, again, you might share it. It might be um, if you're the nurse and you're working with uh, um, a prescriber who's doing this, you might take turns calling the patient on any given day. Um, so uh, I, I think this is where you have to lean on your, your staff to also help check in with the person. And again, the patient just needs constant reassurance of a couple of things. One, um, that, that you're there, you're there to help them troubleshoot, um, that you're not going to abandon them. Also, I think patients sometimes have the impression or feel like they need to not use their opioid any longer. And, and again, the the mechanism here is that they're supposed to continue to use their opioid if they feel like they need to, they need to, 
while the buprenorphine is, is slowly increasing. So I think when people feel like, oh, well, I'm just going to stop the fentanyl entirely, um, they actually get into worse withdrawal because now they're in full withdrawal from the fentanyl and they're not on enough buprenorphine to actually make themselves feel better. So um, I sometimes have to reassure patients that it's okay if they felt like they had to use a tablet of oxycodone or a little bit of fentanyl in order to manage their withdrawal symptoms. So um, we are uh, we are using that a lot in our um, in our outpatient setting. I, I want to talk for just a minute about a couple um, a couple different uh, sites where this is uh, being adopted or could be adopted. Um, the first is. Um, in the emergency department. So uh, there has just been, as far, as far as I'm aware of, only this one study published, there may be more now since it's been a couple months since I've checked, um, of microdosing in the emergency department. So in, in this study, which was published in October of last year, uh, they, they looked at a handful of patients, just uh, 68 were enrolled, and they uh, randomized them to receive either usual care, in other words, a full dose induction versus, um, uh, a microdosing, and what this what this hospital does is they give people a prepack to go home with. The standard dose is a three day prepack um, of uh, two milligram um, tablets or films, and then the, with a maximum dose of twelve milligrams a day. The microdosing was a uh, uh, prepack was a six day, and it, it followed uh, a protocol very similar to the Bernese protocol. And what they just looked at was. Um, when the dust settled, how many or what percentage of those patients remained on um, uh, medication for opioid use disorder at the 30-day mark? And what they found was basically a quarter in the standard dose and about a third in the microdosing group remained on medications. These are small numbers. They're not statistically significant. You can't say that microdosing was better, but, but you can say at least in this, in this very small number of patients, microdosing didn't do worse than their standard dose. And um, a third of patients following up is not, is not terrible from, a, from an emergency department standpoint. Um, again, that's at 30 days, not just people who, who came in the next day, but people who are still in, in treatment at a month in. Uh, next, I just wanna show uh, some slides that were courtesy of my colleague, uh, Susan Calcaterra. These have been presented at ASAM previously and, and Susan presented to, uh, she's presented, I think at other conferences as well. And, um, and re most recently at our little fentanyl evening um, for, uh, for COSAM. Um, and, and Susan is a physician who works on the inpatient addiction consult service at the University of Colorado Hospital. Um, we too have an addiction consult service at, uh, at Denver Health, and that's a really wonderful place to do um, microdosing or low dose induction because you have a captive audience there and you can actually help the patient. You can, you can titrate the medicine as you see fit, um, um, and you have the luxury of seeing that person every day. You also can give that person full opioid agonists if you need to, to manage withdrawal symptoms. So Low dose initiation techniques have been described. I really just pull this up so you can see it, it, it almost doesn't matter what formulation or, uh, or exact dosing you use, um, but all these have been studied. The first is IV buprenorphine in hospitals um, using in doses every four to six hours. Uh, again, the nice thing is that about that is you get in, in very rapid onset. So you can see the effects of that right away. They've also um, looked at doing, uh, using buprenorphine transdermal patches uh, or butrans patches. Um, this may be a little trickier in the inpatient setting because a lot of inpatient hospitals don't have butrans patches on formulary. But the idea is that you um, uh, put the butrans patch on, um, you can increase the dose over every few days, uh, do this over five to six days, um, it takes, the, the problem is that it takes about 72 hours to reach a steady state here. It's kind of expensive. Um, it's indicated only for pain, but you, again, you can use it off label, especially in the inpatient setting. Buprenorphine uh, film or tab, again, this is, I think, very, um, very commonly used even on an inpatient setting. It's also, of course, available as an outpatient. I think in the inpatient setting, sometimes inpatient pharmacists will have concerns about quartering pills or quartering films, they, they a lot of times don't like 
um, you know, in the buprenorphine package insert, uh, the suboxone package insert will say um, it's not meant to be uh, quartered or, or, or split or cut, even though, of course, that's very, very commonly done. Um, so, so some concerns over getting the exact dose right, but um, again, very frequently used and, and probably the most accessible version of this medication. Um, and then finally, uh, the last one is the buprenorphine buccal film, um, brand name Belbuca. Um, this also um, is quite expensive, so it's a little bit uh, a little bit tough to get um, on the inpatient side. Although it's less expensive, um, you do have a, a quicker onset of action compared with the Butrans patch. Um, so uh, you can use again low dose Belbuca and can titrate that up. I just wanted you all to be aware again that it, it doesn't matter that much the exact formulation, even though again most of us would say that very easy to get the film or tablet very difficult to get these other versions or more difficult. Um, so no reason to seek them out. Um, and again, many of us do not have access to inpatient addiction consult services. Um, I find myself being extremely jealous of my inpatient colleagues because they do have uh, the option of seeing that person every day and of um, really managing them. So, so I feel like when we have uh, failed at buprenorphine induction, low dose induction or full dose induction in patients. If we do have a very, very high risk individual or someone with an uncontrolled medical disease that is also using opioids and that perhaps could be admitted to the hospital, you know, I, I really do um, in some cases try to find a reason to admit that person to the hospital to have this done. So um, this is again, I, I just want to show this again. This is um, this is not quite the, the Berenice protocol. This is a little bit different. The Berenice protocol takes you from two milligrams BID to three milligrams BID. But this is, um, this is the inpatient protocol that was used in my hospital and was published by uh, Dr. Terasaki um, a couple of years ago. So he's, he's one of our inpatient addiction consult serv uh, service uh, physicians. And, and you can see, this is how they did it. Quarter tablet of the two milligrams, then a half a tablet, then a full tablet, then two tablets, and then the transition to the eight milligram tablets or films. Um, and then what they would do in the inpatient service is continue the same dose of the full opioid agonist through day six. And uh, again, published a case series and, and had very good success with this along with using uh, these supportive medications. And you can see there are supportive medications also included tizanidine, that would probably be um, for, for muscle aches, um, and dicyclamine for some of the GI cramping that people can experience. Um, a very important point I would like to make with these is that, um, and this goes for all forms of microinduction, is that, um, well, it is always fine to hold a patient at any of these levels in the titration as needed to stabilize the patient so that he or she um, feels like, uh, again, he's in, he or she is in control and also that their, their withdrawal symptoms are not worsening. So what we do in the outpatient service is we might write out a protocol like this or the Bernese protocol, um, and then explain to the patient that if they experience increased withdrawal symptoms that feel really uncomfortable or intolerable in a dose increase from one day to the next, they should go back to the prior day's dose and hold it there for a couple of days and then try again. So we basically just extend out the titration phase. The other um, instructions I give to the patient um, that I try to make clear to them on the outpatient setting is it really is around day four to day five, where in that sweet spot of where the, the buprenorphine receptor occupancy is really um, going up, where the patient is likely to experience uh, more significant withdrawal symptoms. So a lot of times people sail through days one through three and, and they're doing okay and they are, uh, they feel like they're going great guns and they, they head into day four and now the withdrawal symptoms start getting worse. So I try to prep them for that as well, that day four or five might be the time uh, that they experience more symptoms and that's fine, it's okay. It's okay if they have to use their full opioid agonist, it's okay if they need to hold steady at a, at a level before they continue to titrate up. I, I, um, 
I'm going to just depart just a little bit from, um, from microdosing and um, talk again about uh, one other induction strategy, which is simply, can you use high dose buprenorphine um, to induct patients? The emergency department is, an, it seems to be the place where this is most um, uh, of greatest interest. Uh, I think from a protocolized standpoint, it's something you can do quickly. Um, and of course, in an ED, the patient is in a highly monitored setting and can receive adjunctive medications. And so if, if we remember back to that precipitated withdrawal uh, graph showing that people get into precipitated withdrawal because they're sort of knocked down from a full agonist, if you can keep them in your presence in the emergency department for many hours, give them supportive medicines, and then just continue to, con to dose them with buprenorphine, keep dosing them with buprenorphine, you may eventually just sort of over treat the withdrawal symptoms and get them through that. And in fact, I think that's, that's really the standard of care now when we have patients who experience um, buprenorphine uh, precipitated withdrawal, if they do go to the emergency department to get um, management of let's say uncontrollable nausea and vomiting and get some IV fluids, we still try to continue to dose the buprenorphine with the thought that if you just stop the buprenorphine induction entirely, um, you may miss an opportunity to get that person onto treatment. If you, if you stop it entirely, treat them and say, you know, Hey, let this wash out of your system and wait till you feel better. And then we'll see you as an outpatient and we'll try you again. The patient is very unlikely to come back. They're, they're just not going to sign up for that again. And if you get them through that initial severe withdrawal symptoms and make them more comfortable with other medications, maybe you can just continue to dose them until you get them to a high level. So uh, there is interest in looking at high dose buprenorphine inductions with doses typically up to as high as 32 milligrams. And um, that's being looked at in California. This is just an example of a, of a study published very recently in JAMA Network Open. Um, this is a, a retrospective study looking at quite an, a large number of inductions out of a hospital in Oakland with uh, the uh, dosage range you can see here, um, generally over 12 milligrams for that initial dose. And what they found was that really, actually they had uh, that severe withdrawal symptoms were pretty rare. This is probably many of these inductions occurred pre-fentanyl. So um, fentanyl on the West Coast has been a relatively recent uh, uh, experience. Um, and the, these have only been the last couple of years. So some of these are um, certainly uh, non-fentanyl inductions. But again, there is interest in saying, can you just get them through that acute phase in the ED, get them onto a very high dose, 24 to 32 milligrams of buprenorphine, and then have them follow up. Again, trying not to miss the opportunity to get the patient inducted when they're in front of you and when they're in a high, um, high intensity monitoring environment. So um, just... Uh, a little bit of follow-up um, from that uh, from the case is actually sorry this was case one not case two. Um, this was a patient who was on fentanyl and tramadol, and so uh, um, he didn't really tolerate uh, the fentanyl to butrans patch uh, um, titration, um, and so I discussed trying to get him. Um, onto a, uh, you know, trying to use a, a low dose induction technique to try to get him onto buprenorphine naloxone for pain, um, offering him again, the supportive medications um, uh, and um, the buprenorphine naloxone induction um, pathway using a combination of the uh, tablets or films and the butrans patch. Um, patient was considering that, but he was nervous about trying again. He is back on the fentanyl patch and tramadol. He's actually quite stable. So um, I'm having a hard time um, convincing even myself that he needs to do this. Um, but uh, um, I think as, as a lot of us move, um, and again, I'm a primary care physician as well as an addiction medicine doctor. So as, as we think about how to uh, lower risk for some of our chronic opioid therapy patients, um, transitioning to buprenorphine um, using these low dose induction techniques like what was published out of Yale um, becomes really compelling. 
And uh, actually, since I do have a little bit of time, I was I was going to stop there, but I have a few extra minutes. Um, I, I just well, 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 summary slides, but I'll show you one or two others. So in, in summary, um, fentanyl's potency, especially the illicit fentanyl's potency and lipophilicity in, with chronic use, have necessitated these alternative buprenorphine induction strategies. Um, low dose induction does seem to be a viable alternative to full dose inductions. Um, in, in all settings, although I'd say in particular in the inpatient and outpatient settings, the ED setting, it's, it's not as successful in my opinion. Um, it, you know, in that ED study, they were sending people out with pre-packs, which is a really good idea. To me, that's the same as an outpatient induction. Um, giving people a, a tiny dose of uh, buprenorphine in the ED and then sending them out, telling them to follow up with a, a provider is, is probably not a, a recipe for success. But when doing... Uh, low dose inductions, they really require a lot of um, medication support, a lot of adjunctive medications, a lot of provider support, and a lot of reassurance. Uh, high dose inductions may also be an alternative approach, um, particularly for someone who is in an emergency department. But the bottom line is all we have are currently case series and, uh, and case reports. And the experience of clinicians. We, we really do need some uh, prospective trials comparing uh, regular dose inductions versus low dose inductions versus potentially even um, high dose inductions to really know for sure um, that this is uh, effective. Although again, I think it is rapidly becoming the standard of care among clinics all over the place. And, um, and in not only um, for new patients, but again, in my methadone clinic, we have been using um, low dose buprenorphine inductions as a way to transition people who are interested in moving out of the highly regulated methadone program onto buprenorphine where they can receive prescriptions where as they improve and as they, uh, as they get further along in their recovery journey, buprenorphine is just a better option. But the idea of taking someone who's on 80 or 90 or hundred milligrams of methadone and slowly weaning them down to 30 milligrams and then doing a full dose uh, buprenorphine induction or transition, which is, which is actually what's recommended typically. And um, you know, what is in uh what was the old way to do things? It, that's just not an option. Patients are not going to want to wean down from hundred milligrams of methadone to 30, and it's potentially destabilizing and may cause them to use again. So what instead we do is we just leave them on their methadone and start a low dose protocol and then stop the methadone when they are finally uh, on high enough, high enough doses of the, of the buprenorphine. So um, I just want to put in a plug for um, buprenorphine for patients uh, with, with chronic pain. Um, very, very quickly, you know, buprenorphine does have very good effects for pain. It has anti-hyperalgesic effects because it actually antagonizes the kappa opioid receptor. And again, will not cause respiratory depression. So I do think this is a good option. Um, we have the, the various formulations. I think something that sometimes gets lost on individuals is understanding the difference between just how much buprenorphine is in, in these different uh, formulations. So butrans uh, at, at, uh, the, is, is five micrograms an hour, which is a milligram, a morphine milligram equivalent or a milligram equivalent dose of about nine milligrams an hour. So the typical maximum dose you can get out of a butrans patch with the 20 microgram an hour patch is about 36 milligram morphine equivalents. With Belbuca, the buccal strip, it's about 54 milligram morphine equivalents. And compared to comparing that to um, Suboxone, uh, if you have someone on 20 milligram, 24 milligrams, that's the equivalent of 720 milligram morphine equivalents. So, so the the buprenorphine preparations for opioid use disorder are orders of magnitude more potent um, or contain more Suboxone than the ones for pain. And and you know, what that means is that uh, patients who've previously been on very high doses of full agonist opioids may have a hard time, like my patient um, I described, going just to a, a, a patch or a, or a buckle uh, strip. Um, it's simply not going to be enough opioid compared to what they're used to. But Suboxone is really a viable option for a lot of those folks. And um, the last slide I'll show you is simply that I think we miss opioid use disorder in a lot of our chronic pain patients um, because they, they really have um, poor efficacy or side effects. 
and they're not tolerating it. And they, they really fall into the category of what Steve Pasek would have called a chemical coper. They're, they're people who use um, drugs excessively, even prescription uh, drugs uh, kind of uh, excessively um, to manage all symptoms. These are the folks who are, you find they're also on an antidepressant and they're on gabapentin at high doses and they're on a muscle relaxant at high doses and they're using something for sleep and they just don't seem to be doing well yet they continue to take opioids. And so uh, Chow, Ballantyne and Lemke have described this thing what they call um, opioid dependence, which they call a, uh, they think of as a distinct clinical entity. They really um, say it's a complex form of prescription opioid dependence. These are the patients who really, they're being prescribed opioids. So they're not, you know, they're not going to street sources. They're not uh, necessarily um, um, showing a lot of signs of opioid use disorder yet. They continue to use opioids despite really not benefiting from them. They have trouble tapering. They have really severe or protracted withdrawal symptoms and simply can't get off the opioids. They're often depressed as a result of the opioid sometime, they may not be responding to antidepressants. They just have, a, and they're isolated and they don't get a lot of reward in their lives. And so, so they call these folks people with um, opioid dependence or complex opioid dependence, uh, prescription opioid dependence. And I think these is, this is another group of people we need to consider treating with buprenorphine to A, treat their pain better, B, reverse some of the depression and, and C, reduce their risk um, by putting them on a uh, a, an admittedly safer opioid. And, and these folks might benefit also from these low dose induction protocols. So I'm gonna stop there and uh, leave a little bit of time for questions. I wanna thank you all for attending and, and I'll take a look at the chat now and see, um, but if any of you have questions, um, please feel free to ask them now. Okay, if anybody has any questions, we can take those. I've also been monitoring some of the comments in the chat. Um, I have a quick question. Go ahead. Um, yes, um, <clears throat> hi, thank you for this wonderful seminar. Um, I'm just I'm curious because of uh, the amount of clonidine, um, you know, obviously there's gonna be a drop in blood pressure. Are you finding that it's, uh, it's problematic because oftentimes we do find that that we even have to hold the dose, you know, in lieu of, you know, sometimes people can get IV fluids, but usually not on our floor um, for, for this, but um, that usually is a problem. We just, you know, tell them to hydrate, but we do end up holding it, especially, um, and, and if it's coupled with the um, Xanaflex, which also does drop the BP, what are the, some of the other alternatives, um, if there are any that you would suggest other than the clonidine and the Xanaflex, which both really do drop the BP significantly, I've seen. Yeah, and that's actually my rate, main reason for not using tizanidine um, is, is that I don't like the additive effects of the blood pressure lowering effect. Yes. Um, I think, you know, lofexidine is actually FDA approved for, for management withdrawal symptoms. It, it also can cause lower blood pressure, maybe not quite as severe as with clonidine. Oh, um, what is the name of that? I'm sorry. Could you spell that? Lofexidine, which is L-O-F-E-X. Uh -huh. I-D-I-N-E. Okay. That's an alternative. Okay. Thank mm -hmm. you. It's, it's actually been studied and, you know, it's, it's been proven to actually uh, assist with withdrawal symptoms. You know, we all use clonidine off label for withdrawal symptoms. It's not FDA approved for that. Lofexidine is actually the, it, it's uh, same mechanism. It's an alpha agonist, central alpha agonist, but it's, um, it's at least approved for that. Um, I, I just have people use lower doses and hold the doses. So I think, especially in I see a lot of young people with opioid use disorder. So I have the luxury of using 0.1 to 0.2, but in older patients, it might be 0.1 twice a day. That's actually a pretty common dose, I think used in older patients. And you can even try a half of a 0.1. Um, I think then also if they don't tolerate, I always also try to remind patients the clonidine, even though it's helpful, it's not that helpful. Um, right. It is only used for the sympathetic effects of opioid withdrawal. It doesn't treat all the other things. So if you have to dump the clonidine, I think that's, that's really perfectly fine um, mm. and just using other medicines. And, and again, um, gabapentin is another good option that has some of those, some of the anti, at least some of the anti-anxiety effects and doesn't have the same effect on, on blood pressure. And I can see someone says they also use baclofen along with that as adjuncts and, and yeah, low dose of gabapentin um, it, better in some cases than high doses. And I find gabapentin to be again, pretty well tolerated even in older patients. So, um, I think that's something that you use as an alternative. 
Thank you. Just to be clear on the low fexidine, um, the dose on that would be what? What would you recommend that? You know, I have yet to use it because I work in a public hospital where you don't have access to that expensive medication. So I, I, I can't tell you, I would actually okay, just I'll call. ask the pharmacist. Yes. Yes. The yeah. pharmacy. Mm -hmm. Okay. All yeah. right. Um, yes. Um, let's see. I just, I had one other question about, um, you had mentioned, um, you know, pairing this low, you know, the low dose with the patient already on their either illicit or other medication. And you said you would not recommend it if they were coming in, you know, obviously, you know, having used, um, you know, um, heroin for a while, you would recommend right at the start, would you recommend the high 24, would you, uh, the Suboxone 20, the high dose instead, that would be the most. Yeah, or, or regular induction. I think what we've experienced with heroin, just like other short acting opioids is that, uh, that's pretty easy to do a straightforward standard induction, you know, okay. have the patient stop their short acting opioid, wait at least 12 hours, et cetera, you know, get a high cow score or sows score of at least, you know, eight or 17 respectively, and, and then start them. And we don't really see much problem with that. Um, and we don't see much precipitated withdrawal with, with heroin and other mm -hmm. short acting opioids. It's specifically with fentanyl and, and maybe some of the long acting prescription opioids, where I think the, the low dose induction, um, uh, approach is a, is a more viable option. So you would always wait the, let me just be clear on that. You would always wait the 12 hours after the low, low drug, uh, the last drug usage of heroin to start begin. At, at least, at, I mean, as long least. as people can go. Yeah. As long or as, as long, can, uh, can it, can it be done sooner? Sometimes we do do it sooner. That's why I'm questioning that 12 hour. I mean, I think you, it, you know, the proof is in the pudding. If someone's okay. used last six hours, they're in a ton of withdrawal and you give them buprenorphine and they feel better you just had a successful induction. So you, you can, I think in an, in a okay. modern setting, it's easier to, I'm doing outpatient. So I'm usually saying, oh, okay, well, this is inpatient. I'm in an yep. inpatient chemical mica unit. Yep. And, so I think and, you, you have the option to do that when you're, you have someone in front of you on an inpatient unit. And you would start them off at the high dose at that point, the 24. Well, no, I wouldn't start at 24. I wouldn't automatically, I would go to a standard induction, which okay, is, standard. is typically okay. a four milligram, two okay. to four milligram initiation start and then wait 90 to 120 minutes and then maybe give them another dose and then do the same thing and maybe another dose and maybe give them up to 12 or 16 milligrams the first day um, with with a standard induction. And your experience, how long should they be on this? I mean, even after having stopped their illicit drug use, how long should one continue this? Should it, like with methadone, we have patients coming in 30 years later, still on methadone even as high doses of 180 milligrams, how long would you, I mean, is there any studies that show the effects on long-term replacement therapy? Um, no, I, I, we might need to have like another 30 minute phone conversation. Just okay. To talk about okay. Thank you. Okay. Right. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. A couple more questions. Thank you. I want to see if I can just get to real quick. Sure. So I had a quick question, in terms, Dr. Bloom. In terms of the low, low dosing, uh, is it is it recommended that they be in a medical detox or an inpatient? Is this being done in the outpatient setting? It's being done routinely in the outpatient setting. Yeah. Okay, thank you. And another question was, um, you talked a little bit about the gabapentin again, but how long do you use that? What's your dose and how long do you use that? Um, I will typically, the, the dose may be, um, I'll, I'll usually use 300 milligrams three times a day or 600 milligrams twice a day. And then um, I uh, usually continue that for in the seven to 14 day ish range. Okay. A another comment was the, uh, the Butrans patch, um, that that is not approved for opioid use disorder in the United States. And it would be a, a waiver issue. Um, it, can you speak to that? That's right. I do not. Well, first of all, I never use it for opioid use disorder. I would only be using it for a pain patient. You're talking now, about pain, pain patient can have pain and opioid use disorder, and you can say you're using it for pain, and that's okay. Yes. Um, it, okay. it is an issue if you're, again, if you're in a hospital setting, and you're trying to use a, one Butrans patch, have the patient continue for five days, and then as part of a microdosing or a low dose induction protocol, that's that's different. You may run into some problems, but, um, yeah. but in general, yeah, I'm, I'm talking about using that for pain. I see. Okay, very good. Thank you so much. I mean, it is a minute after 11. So our time is up, but that was very good information. Thank thing? you very There, I did have a question. I apologize. I can just send it to you afterwards. Um, but I, I was interested to hear, I know you said ideally that 
the microdosing would occur inpatient because they can be closely monitored, but you do do it on an outpatient basis. And you mentioned that you wanted to see that the patient had adequate support. And I wanted to hear more about your criteria for that. Like, what are you, how are you defining adequate support where you feel like that would be a good candidate to have that microdosing regimen? Maybe I can answer that in an email. That would be great. Uh, I'd be happy to do that. Um, uh, I don't know. Um, uh, Dana, can you share my email with the um, yes. participants? Okay. That'd yes, yes, absolutely. Uh, okay. Robert, you have it. If you could put it in the chat real quick, and then we'll capture everything that's in the chat and uh, hopefully send it out as a document to people as well. Yeah. Okay. I'm interested in that question too. And somebody else in the chat box is, is it possible he could briefly summarize his sure. response to that yeah. one question? Yeah, I'm happy to. So what we usually do, what I can, I mean, first of all, I, I think if a person is um, uh, a good candidate for uh, low dose induction, it really is someone who, um, you, who is instructable, who has enough health literacy to sort of understand what you're talking about, right? They, so they, they can't have really any cognitive issues, or if they do, they should have a family member, which is also ideal, um, you know, in the home who can help sequence the medications. Then um, what we do is we arrange um, phone calls at least every other day um, and a visit within the week. Um, for some people, it's in, again, like the person, um, people I did this week, I haven't talked to them every day. I've talked to them twice, but, uh, you know, for some people it might be an everyday phone call. Um, so I think that to me is adequate support. I, I mean, we can look at a million different scenarios, but I think they should be housed, you know, ideally they're housed. They can hole up somewhere with their withdrawal symptoms and not, and have a, a place to sleep or go to sleep where they don't have to worry about, um, being assaulted, you know, sorry, but those, those are the kind of folks that I, I see. And so, you know, you know, housing under, and under cognitive understanding of the medications. Um, and I would say also someone who hasn't previously failed buprenorphine, this is not somebody who is, you know, clearly a better methadone candidate because they have um, um, dual diagnosis uh, and they've previously failed buprenorphine. Um, so so I, I tend to, people without, you know, uh, someone who is unhoused with a major mood disorder and or a psychotic disorder who's using multiple substances would not be a great candidate for this. Um, for this kind right, of program. thank you. To summarize. Thank you. Okay, everybody. I guess we'll we could keep talking. Maybe we'll have to uh, look at uh, having some more information about this, and especially as more information is learned. Uh, but this was a, a great up to date, I think, review of what what is known, what some people are doing, and we really really appreciate it. Uh, Robert did put Dr. Bloom's email in the chat down there, so um, that's available. Uh, it sounds like you'd be open to answering questions, Dr. Bloom. Sure. Uh, and that, that's wonderful. Uh, thank you, everyone. Please complete the survey. Mm -hmm. And for all the nurses out there, you'll be getting your, your CEU from this, okay? Thank you. So thank you, thank you so much. Okay. All right. Bye. 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 Bye.